I first started doing signal integrity work about 25 or 30 years ago in the late 80s. And um, at that time, almost no one understood it. And when I would do a class, it would get a huge turnout. Today, I don't get quite the turnout <clears throat> that I used to because I think a lot more people understand today what it takes to do impedance control and why it's critical. I think that's a big part of it. They know why it's critical and they know why they need to terminate transmission lines and they understand the board stack is a big part of it. They get all that stuff that, and I think a lot of people know that. Where I think they're falling down is they don't necessarily understand the impact they have on manufacturing and they don't always design to make things optimum from a manufacturing standpoint. And I have a feeling that you guys probably see a bit of that from time to time. Boards that could be more producible than they are, uh, that could be, have better impedance control than they have based on the impedance they're requesting. One of the things I encourage people to do in my classes is to learn the boards that their fabricators make. In other words, if you're going to get a 6, 8, or 10 layer board, find out what is the natural 6 layer that the fabricator wants to build. What, is the what are the dielectrics? What are the copper weights? Find a way using that natural 6 layer that the fabricator wants to build. Find a way to design around that board, design around those dielectrics, design around that copper weight to get, even if it requires different line widths on different layers, to hit some target impedance of say 50 or 60 ohms. Design around what the fabricator is building and let them know in your fab drawing this is your 6 layer, this is your 8 layer, this is your 10 layer. And if you do that, you're going, they're going to get a lot better throughput. We did that at L3 and we were getting high 90% throughput from our fabricators even on 12, 14, 16 layer boards that had very tight impedance control and worked well. I think yes it would and, I, and I, as I said, I encourage designers to find out what their fabricators are doing. Maybe the fabricators need to be more proactive to let designers know what they can do and what's available as a standard 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 layer stack up. So that designers would know, geez, if I follow this methodology, then I'm going to get better throughput, I'm going to get better impedance control because I'm going to be in their sweet spot. And I think, yes, there would be a, certainly be a place for that. Uh, insertion loss and, and attenuation are very important for designers, especially at high speeds. Now, people, people doing stuff at lower clock frequencies, uh, as lo if they can slow down the rising and falling edges, aren't as concerned, of course, you would expect that. But people operating in the gigabit domain uh, certainly have to pay attention, especially to attenuation and losses. In fact, I'm doing a class this afternoon on that very subject. A lot of good materials, as you know, available for such a thing, such as the iSpeed material. I haven't specifically used that exact material, but I've used other materials with similar loss characteristics, so I know the advantage, certainly, that that offers. A material like iSpeed certainly can do that. There is one bit of good news for the design world on that vein, um, that being that the ICs that are being designed and manufactured today often have pre-emphasis and equalization built into the driver and receiver stages. So the result is that high-speed materials, probably you don't want to hear this, are less needed today than they've ever been, even though speeds are going up, because they can buy ICs that can handle uh, the losses by altering the shape of the waveform either before it's sent or at the receive end. And so that's a good thing actually for the design world. It doesn't mean they won't need high speed materials because especially when they get into the tens of gigabits, now all of a sudden they're going to need both. I've done design up in the tens of gigabits and you need to focus on quality materials and on equalization or pre-emphasis. You have to think about all of the above at that domain. The idea is that by creating four different transitions, that's kind of like pre-emphasis because what you do, you change the amount of energy per unit time that you're pulling out of the power bus and driving into the transmission line because you're doing four time steps. And the idea is it allows you to reduce loss tangent concerns and skin effect loss concerns 
in high-speed boards by doing that. And the other benefit of it is the EMI benefit. You have one clock signal for every four bits. Instead of double, double data rate, it's quadruple data rate. So the clock rates per given data rate can go down, which improves the EMI signature of the system. All of these things are benefits of that. The downside is you have a smaller noise margin per step. And so you do have to be more careful with things like reflections, uh, transmission line impedance control, termination sizes, all of that becomes more critical because you have a smaller noise margin. Maybe possibly the length of the line. And the length of the line can to some degree become restricted as well. The way the IC industry is miniaturizing, the PCB industry has not kept pace. Uh, what's driving that, of course, are smaller pitches of ICs, especially with BGAs. You know, if you, have a, if you have a quad flat pack design, even if it has fine pitch, you can branch the leads out off of the pattern, big deal, you know. But with BGAs, that's, that is a big deal. It's quite a problem because you somehow have to get all of those lines out from that very tight pitch part. And that's a real challenge. I mean, when you get down below 0.5 millimeter pitch and under 0.4, 0.3 millimeter pitch, it requires some pretty fine line technology. And I am a firm believer that the fabricators who can step up to that world are going to have the future in their hands. I feel there's an absolute need for one and two mil technology. If you know Happy Holden, you're probably aware that when he worked for uh, Hewlett Packard 20 years ago, they were doing one and two mil line technology in some of their stuff because they had to to be able to produce some of the products they were putting out. And so, yes, that what's happening now, it's gone from a specialty of people like HP doing it to where the whole world is going to be moved in that direction, whether they want to or not. Physics don't change, do they? Physics. Laws of physics, thank God, are constant and Congress can't affect them. It's an interesting question. What, what perspective do they need to understand? People in the automotive world still want to stay with very low layer count boards if they can. That's, that's key to them because low layer count means low cost. I, somebody, the first time I did a presentation for the automotive world in Detroit uh, years ago, I was told by somebody from that industry, there's an there's a expression we have in the automotive world, who do I have to kill to save that penny? And of course, they don't really mean it, obviously but they are very serious about saving money. They will spend a lot of money in a design to take a few pennies out of the design. So layer count really matters. And the IoT world, the Internet of Things world, is moving in that direction as well because they're going to be one, two, and four layer boards. And that's really where that world is headed. And the key is that people need to learn to design and still maintain high quality signal integrity in one, two, and four layer boards. And that is not an easy task. Um, I'm starting to put together material on how to design IoT boards in low layer count and still maintain that kind of quality and consistency that we now have in higher layer counts so that people in that domain can find ways to do it. It's how, there are ways to control impedance even in a one layer board. You have to do everything in a coplanar fashion obviously, but you have to have a return path for every trace, just as you would if it were a high-speed board that was high layer count. And that's the way the IoT and automotive and appliance world even are going to have to start thinking because as they get into reduced IC sizes, they're going to be thrust into the same exact problem that we were talking about a minute ago with fine lines and low layer counts, and it's going to affect everybody, and they all need to think about this. Yeah, the fine lines, you don't necessarily need fine lines in low layer count. But when density gets huge and you still need low layer count, they're going to have to think about that as well. As long as density is low, they can go with standard line weights and widths and, you know, standard copper weights without any issues at all. But they still have to understand what it means to design a transmission line. They have to know that every signal coming out of these devices are fast. You mentioned that Dan Beaker was here, and I had a dinner with Dan three weeks ago in Detroit, and he was telling me about an IC that, that, that uh, uh, NXP Semiconductor recently redesigned where they went from uh, like a two, one or two nanosecond rising edge down to 
you know, tens of picosecond rise times at the output of this thing. And my question to him was, why did they do that? And he said, I asked the designers the same question. And the answer I got was, well, that's the output transistor that we chose to use. Well, it wasn't necessarily a good decision on their part, but the reality is the world's gonna be stuck with that, like it or not. And the automotive world's gonna be stuck with that. And they're going to be doing impedance control. They're going to have to do field containment, just like the high speed world is doing today, like it or not. Because regardless of their clock frequencies, they're gonna have high speed signals because of edge rate. It's a matter of current flow. The problem is they're missing the point. If you have very low frequency current flow, DC currents, for example, that are flowing, if you have DC energy that's moving, and, and when I say DC, I don't mean DC voltages, I mean DC voltage and current, because it has to be both or it's not low frequency. People think that, that power bus delivery, oh, you're dealing with a constant 3.3 volts, it's low frequency, uh-uh. The current is switching at hundreds of megahertz or gigahertz speeds, just because the voltage is constant, the current is not. So when you are dealing with really low frequency, current flow when it is truly low frequency. They may need thicker planes for that reason, but what people lose sight of is that when it comes to power delivery, most of the energy is not at low frequencies. It's at very high frequencies because it has to match the switching speeds of the IC's output. And you have to provide all of the harmonics in that square wave from the power bus, from the clock to 0.5 divided by rise time, it has to be provided to the output stage from the power bus. So it is very high frequency. The result is that skin effect takes over at frequencies beyond a few hundred megahertz. When you have rising edges that are sub 500 picoseconds, you're now dealing with frequencies of one, two, and three gigahertz. And skin effect is going to be the dominating factor in terms of how much current the copper can handle. And one ounce copper won't do any better than half ounce copper in that domain because once you go up beyond a certain frequency, you don't use the entire copper thickness. So people are deluding themselves into believing that they need one and two ounce copper in planes when in fact they don't. They really need to examine what is my current flow at high frequencies, then do the skin effect calculations and determine how thick the copper needs to be based on skin effect. And they're going to find that very often even quarter ounce copper is good enough for planes. You don't need one and two ounce copper in planes. It's, and in fact, I ran into that when I was at AMD in the late 1990s. And the engineers there believed they need those heavy planes. They didn't. They didn't. And I convinced them eventually that they didn't need that. Roughness of copper does have an impact, unfortunately. That is a, that is a true issue, and that is a big deal. Um, what people don't realize, people tend to want to look at voltage and current when they analyze everything. Skin effect is about fields. It's about the fields. Everything is about the fields, actually. But uh, skin effect is one of those issues. The roughness of copper makes it harder for the fields to induce an even current into the trace and the plane because of that roughness. Because the current actually comes from the energy in the fields. People think that the current and the voltage come from the driver. The, the fields come from the driver. And the fields generate the voltage and current in the transmission line or in the planes as they move through the dielectric. So the fields moving through the dielectric insert the current into the copper. And the rougher the copper is, the harder it is to get even current flow through the copper. And so the losses become greater with rougher copper. So smoother copper does, I mean, things like um, very, low very low profile, yes. And I was trying to think of, it's made through, it's made by, uh, instead of using a constant DC voltage on the drum, I think they can remove this stuff. You use an AC voltage to put some on, take some off, right? and you end up with very low profile copper. So yeah, I think people need to understand that they're gonna to need to go to a very low profile or at least a moderately low profile copper in order to get the kind of insertion losses and lost tangent, or not lost tangent, but skin effect losses that they expect to see in transmission lines. Oh, I get it. So you're plating the trench. Oh, I can't wait to see this. That is really interesting. That is really interesting. The trench then is very smooth by definition. And so the plated copper is very smooth. It's like the drum side 
of electrodeposited copper. Yes, that makes perfect sense. That is brilliant. That is brilliant, and that's going to really make a difference in the behavior of high-speed signals. People who are operating in the tens of gigabits are going to really appreciate that. People under 10 gig, you know, two, three, four gig, eh, who cares, you know? And, and people think, as soon as I go above a gig, oh my God, the world's going to fall apart. No, it's actually above 10 gig where the world starts to fall apart. It's surprising how a couple of gigs have become a very commonplace thing. Oh, two, three gigs, everybody does it these days. You know, everybody's doing that. Even the automotive world, oh shoot, that's easy. Understand that the energy in a circuit is in the fields. And if you expect for your circuit boards to function as you want them to and to pass EMI testing, you must know where the fields are in the circuit and you must design circuit boards, most importantly, the stack up. To stack up must be designed correctly to make the fields go where you want them to go so they won't expand and won't cause interference problems or EMI issues. And the best piece of advice I could give designers is focus on the fields. And one way to do that, Ralph Morrison, who's now 92 years old, God love him, has recently released a book called Fast Circuit Design and Energy Management. It's a brand new book. I just bought it literally last week myself. It's a new one? It's a brand new book from Ralph it's Morrison. Like it's, 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 yeah, so I, own, I own all 13 of his previous books, and this is his 14th book. And it will tell designers what they really need to know about the management of energy in circuits to help control interference, EMI, and signal integrity issues. Very important publication.